Um, as we were praying there and uh, we were thinking of names for God, the one I kept getting was El Roy, which if anyone knows, that's when Hagar was in the desert and she was saying, it's the God who sees me. And I wonder uh, if many people realise that, that God's the God that sees them, would they not be in church? Or would they actually be in? Would revival actually happen if people outside of church realised that God saw them and he was there in their affliction and their trouble? And I was thinking of my own testimony, which I'm going to share tonight, and how many times I can say, ah, yeah, Elroy, God saw me. He carried me through that. Um, so, yes, let's begin. I'll start the timer so I don't take too long. So, for the majority of you here that don't know me, you've got very little clue of who I am. Hi, nice to meet you. It's very lovely to be here. I hope you're well. Um, my name's Sarah. I grew up in the glorious town that is Carrick Fergus. I was raised by two very loving parents. I have a mostly loving little brother. I've been very blessed to have all four of my grandparents still alive, plus a bonus grandparent in the form of my nanny's prayer partner. Um, and I have two very cute dogs. I have a blessing of an insane amount of friends that are godly in pursuing him, and a pretty decent fiance. Yeah, I suppose I have to say that, don't I? I have never been bullied in school. I, the only kind of drugs I'm somewhat familiar with are vitamins or paracetamol. I never really went crazy. Uh, that's debatable. And in terms of my own health struggles physically, the worst I've had is a few concussions from cheerleading injuries or that one time my appendix burst. So yes, in my 23 years of life, it's been pretty perfect. It's been a pretty easy ride, some would say, but that doesn't mean I haven't been hurt or journeyed through hurt or felt pain. And sadly, my story is actually like a lot of people's, a lot of people's in church and out of church where the place I got hurt the most isn't the place anyone would expect, but it was church itself. And now when I say church, I think I should make it really clear from the start. I don't mean an institutionalized body or an organization or a building. I mean people, I mean Christians, you know, we are the body of Christ and we suck sometimes. I'm including myself in that because I can be a rubbish person, like that's human nature. You know, we really uh, can cause pain and we can cause heartache for some people. And I think it's actually important that we recognize that. You know, it's something that we like to brush under the carpet, don't we, in church? Oh, no, we're the good ones. It's fine, it's fine. Like, that didn't actually happen. Um, and we're all guilty of it, but we need to recognize it because I, I can't tell you the amount of friends I've grown up with that I grew up with in church that are no longer walking with Jesus today because they got hurt and they got hurt by another Christian and they couldn't see God in that. So we need to address it. Firstly, as a kid, I loved church. Need to make that clear. I wasn't one of those kids that my parents had to force to go to church. No, I loved church. I loved the community atmosphere. I loved worship. There was a wee woman that always had her tambourine every week. I thought she was amazing. I loved praying. I loved Bible studies. I loved learning more about Jesus. He was really my best mate from a really young age. Yeah, no, I loved church. It was actually uh, after a Sunday school preach of the gospel where at six I became a Christian and I gave my life to God. Now, I'd always grown up in a Christian home, and like I said, Jesus was always my best friend. Um, we were always constantly praying, even if it was just for mum to be able to get out of a junction, we were praying, you know, it was the small things right up to the nighttime prayers, regardless of the time of day. But um, at six, that was when I kind of really accepted the gospel message and made it my own. Funny story with that actually is, so the way it had been described was, you know, the Holy Spirit comes in and transforms your life which we all know is true, but when you're six and you're a little bit innocent mind, you know, of a child, you kind of misinterpret that. So I kind of thought that like, oh, and I'd also heard that there was like a party in heaven. So I was expecting a wee bit of a party on earth too. So like, I remember praying, you know, Lord, come into my life. I want to be transformed and nothing happened. And I was absolutely devastated. And then I was like, right, okay, next night, maybe you just didn't hear me. Lord, come into my life. I want to be transport transformed, waited nothing happened and this cycle continued for about two weeks where I was like I'm not getting any warm fuzzy feeling there's no like confetti coming from the ceiling and then eventually I went to my mum and I was like mum why doesn't God want to come into my heart and mum explained the gist of salvation to me and I finally 
actually got it. And from that night, I was confident of my faith. You know, I was always a really confident kid, really bubbly, really out there. And now I was just a Jesus freak. You know, I was, I was the confident bubbly kid that loved Jesus and wanted to tell everyone about it. So I was always very sure of myself and very sure of my faith. At 11 then, I moved churches by my own choice to a more traditional church. You know, I'd grown up in a Pentecostal church, moved to the traditional church, just because it had a bigger youth group. And I was like, oh, bigger youth group means it must be better. Not always the case, but it was fantastic. You know, I love the Bible teaching there. And um, for years I've been praying to have like friends that were my own age that loved Jesus and those prayers were answered and it was fantastic. You know, it was a great time because we were always going to youth conferences. Um, and there was one in particular that I remember going to at 13 where um, this guy got up and he shared his testimony and he was a former drug addict but he shared it with such a passion and such like a fervency and he just he really really loved God but he was also really really broken for the lost and there was something in that that I was just like oh my goodness I love his compassion for other people I love his fire for God I want that I'm gonna recommit I came back and my mum and my nanny were like you didn't need to recommit you never left him but there was something in that that night where I was just like that's, that's what I want. Okay, I don't want the drugs. I don't want to have a story where I've been completely messed up. But God, I want that love for people. I want that love for you that's so incredibly passionate. So that was a night um, that kind of changed my life. Because what you don't know when you're young in your faith and you're a little naive is when you pray those big prayers, God doesn't just go, oh, you want grace for other people? There you go, magic, done. No, he has to take you through trials and testing, and so he did. Um, and often to do that when it comes to, doing, com comes to having grace for other people is he has to make them hurt you. He has to give you this grace that can come even in the difficult times. And that's where my journey sort of begins. So two years later, 15 now at the same church, and I've been going through a bit of a difficult season where these really good friends that I'd made that were the answer to my prayer were kind of bullying me because I was too joyful. How awful of me. <laughs> Forgot we were meant to not have meant to have the joy of the Lord, right? And because my confident faith also meant that I got the opportunity to share a lot. And when you're sharing from the front, even if that's your gifting, you're gonna have other people that are jealous of that and obviously you don't see that when you're 15 and people are picking on you but that's basically what had happened and I've actually spoken to some of the people since then and they apologized and admitted that that was the case at the time but these were also friends that whilst they were trying to exclude me from things and pick on me I was also walking with them through mental health struggles where they had eating disorders, self-harm and suicidal tendencies and it was just very overwhelming for my young brain. At the same time, I was in my first relationship, which anyone knows is very messy when it's two hormonal teenagers and arguments fly off the handle at any given moment. But what didn't make it any easier was this boy hadn't necessarily had the easiest life at the time. And despite coming with amazing reviews from my old church, he actually struggled a lot with being a toxic person and the relationship was quite emotionally abusive. So I learned at a pretty young age that people in church can compare, they can judge, and they can be jealous of you. But also, as long as you look okay, as long as you look fine, it doesn't matter if you've got toxic behavior underneath or a poor and corrupt character, because as long as you look the part and you have a servant heart, that's fine, right? So these were the kind of like characteristics that I um, learned in church. And it didn't help that the older I got in the traditional church, the more I kind of got criticized by older members, adult members of the congregation for my worship style or partaking in communion or serving and leading from the front because I'm a girl, don't tell anyone. But you know, like these little things all started to pile up. And the final straw actually happened when I was 18 and drama broke out in the youth. I couldn't even tell you where it began, but whatever happened, it led to some lies being spread about me by the close friends that I'd fought for for so long. And these lies went around the youth and then went around the church. And I was devastated. 
the only what thing that I still had that I was clinging on to was my face. Like that was the only thing. I was just like, well, at least I still have my best mate, Jesus. You know, <laughs> that's the only thing getting me through this. And I found it really hard, but I decided that I'd just keep my mouth shut for fear of causing more drama, you know, like at this point, anxiety had already started to fill my heart and a fear of failure had kind of cropped up and I didn't want to be seen as making things worse and not being acceptable uh, or of an acceptable standard. Um, the leadership of the church never once queried things with me. They never asked for my side of the story. So I left somewhat quietly, but completely and utterly crushed. Um, I felt like I was very let down and you know what, in hindsight, I can see that I wasn't the only one, you know, it was the people that were hurting me that were let down too, because no one was holding them accountable for their actions and ultimately it's hurt people that hurt people, so they needed healing and prayer too. I kind of recited myself that it was fine because it must, it must just be the traditional church. You know, I'll just I'll, I'll pop back over to the Pentecostal church and it'll all be fine because it's, it's just traditional churches that are the problem. This will be fine. I think that's how I just comforted myself. You know, I was like, if I just label it as it's a denominational problem, then it means that it's not my issue to have to deal with, right? So I went back over and in this new old church, whatever you want to look at it, I felt initially very welcomed. I wasn't criticized for the same thing. I was able to settle into a new friendship group and everything was dandy. I had a new boyfriend. Everything seemed very healthy. So off I went to uni. But what I didn't realize was that I was still carrying this anxiety and insecurity from the first church, like a rock sack. So no matter what church I stepped into, I still had like this almost paranoia and this fear of everything happening again. So it meant that I was quite reluctant to serve, even though I was still, because of my confident personality, pushed to the front. It means that I often left church feeling worse than the way I'd felt before I arrived. And it was just this cycle that even though it was coming to meet God and meet God's people, other people could actually, through really small things, make me feel less of myself. And back at home then, even though I'd found a wonderful church at uni, back at home the church drama started breaking out again because that's, we're people. <laughs> the church is people and we mess up and we cause pain. And like I said, drama started breaking out. And somehow, despite me being on the other side of the country, my boyfriend was on the phone telling me about who X, Y, and Z was blaming me for X, Y, and Z, and this, this person said this, and apparently I'm at the center of it all. And anyway, it just added to the anxiety. And whatever happened was um, when I came home then, I was rejected from the friendship group again. So I had these moments that started to pile up where I was just feeling like rejection from Christians and rejection from church and not seeing any action from leadership. Um, there was a lot of isolation in this season. Now, I mean, like, because I was doing that to myself, um, but also no one was really reaching out into that. Now, I can also say that there was plenty of people praying for me in this season because as much as the church was also the place causing me pain, it was also the place that was uplifting me and upholding me in that time. So if you're someone here and you're like an intercessor and you're praying for a younger member of your congregation, but you're not seeing any fruit, don't stop because you might be the only one that's given, empowering them to have the strength to rely on God. Um, and it was only through God's strength that I was able to get through certain things. You know, it was in this season where I can tell you of the countless times I was in the toilets of any church that I was in, Gurnan, because I was like, oh, why do I still feel like this? Why is this drama happening to me? Why again? Why now? I thought I was, I was able to deal with this. Why can't Christians just love me? Why am I messing up? How is this my fault? And I was just a bit of a mess and I was just pretty gutted all the time, especially when it came to church. Then it fast forward again and we're 21 now, so only two years ago. And the final drama that I can say of, or big church hurt that I could talk about, broke out where my boyfriend broke up with me, which in itself is a pretty painful experience. Let's be honest, the church isn't very good with dealing with breakups, is it? Like, no one really knows how to deal with the touchy stuff. Like, it's just like, oh, I'm so sorry. Ah. No one's really sure of how to go about that. And I think it's because we don't really like to deal with the brokenness and the mess of relationships and anyway. But 
I had that mess to deal with, but then there was additional things going on at the time to do with the breakup that meant that it was just very painful. The church was very heavily involved in the breakup because of different things that had gone on and there was little action taken, I felt, over the things that were happening to me. So I was again feeling devastated and I'm not a shy person, you've probably realised that. So I was quite vocal towards certain people about how I felt and about the action that I felt needed to be taken. And I only ever got told to be quiet and to just sit down and pay my dues sort of thing, just get through. I recited to myself that this is just what church is like. We just have to settle for pain and being rubbish, but we just have to go along with it because God tells, tells us we have to go to church. So I'll just go and I'll just, I won't serve. I won't, I won't preach anymore, I just won't do anything because when you do that you're in a position where you're vulnerable to attack and I'll just take the easy route. I'll just, you know, recite myself to whatever's easiest because I didn't really want to have to deal with the pain. And it's funny when you recite yourself to something that's usually when God goes, Haha, no. So lockdown happened and I was removed from church she would be sitting there going oh my goodness this must have been her dream but <laughs> in that I was actually really devastated that I wasn't getting to go and be with certain people that really did mean a lot to me you know yes the church had broken me yes the church had broken me countless times but I still just wanted to be there because God had given me the desire to serve and to be in community like that's why we're meant to go to church in the first place but it was in lockdown that God got to truly begin the administration of healing to me. You know, like throughout it all, I can see in hindsight where God carried me. You know, um, when I read the story of Joseph, which is one of my favorite biblical characters, he finds himself in a pit because of jealousy. He finds himself then being elevated from that pit because of his hard work and diligence. But then he finds himself in prison. And then he's in that prison for a ridiculous number of years before he finally gets elevated again and like that was something I was able to relate to throughout my countless ups and downs and my, co my constant struggles which was what was able to uphold me. And my favourite verse is Jeremiah 29 verse 11 so I was able to always go oh yeah well like I know that God has plans to prosper me, plans that won't harm me, plans to give me hope and a future. So I clung to those ideals, but it was only in lockdown that I was able to actually minister them to my heart, my, well, not myself, but, you know, allow God to do the work in me rather than just constantly doing this battle. Um, what I kind of learned is emotional healing or healing from church hurt isn't a one-off prayer. You know, there's many times I went up to prayer minister and was like, can you, just, can you just get rid of this for me, please? Like, I just don't really want to carry it anymore. But it's not as simple as that. It has to be a daily act of surrender, of going, God, here, have this baggage. Here, God, this bitterness and unforgiveness. You take it because I don't want to deal with it. And, you know, God, Jesus himself reminds us of this when he's telling us of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Because he says, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. He knows people suck and he knows people will hurt us, but he knows we have to daily give it over to him in an act of forgiveness. And it was also in lockdown where I started to realize of that and was reminded of that prayer when I was 13, where I'd asked him to give me compassion for other people. And I realized that God needed to break me, to mold me so that I could go out and live out his purpose that he had for me. It's been a long journey. It's been a long wrestle with God over the last 10 years of loving people and hating people and loving people and hating people and loving the church and hating the church and loving the church and hating the church. Finally, I'm in a place where I can say I love the church regardless. It just sucks sometimes. And that's a nice acceptance. But that's the kind of thing when you wrestle with God, isn't it? You always lose. But you always lose self-pity. You always lose selfishness and pick up a grace for other people. So what will I be able to share with you guys from this journey of hurt that I have been on? Well, I have four points that hopefully 
will be able to help you if you're dealing with emotional hurt or if you know someone that is dealing with emotional hurt, maybe you can walk through these four points with them. And they, they're an, an acronym, I think that's the right word, is it? An acronym? Anyway, for hurt. So the first letter is H, humility. Maybe you need to recognize that the hurt that people caused to you were people that were dealing with hurt themselves. You know, it says in Philippians 2, 4, to not look at your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So ask God to give you eyes to see the hurt that other people are going through. Ask God to give you the eyes to see the people that are hurting you the way he sees them. Because, you know, he still sees him as his children. He still loves them. And like that, that can be painful, but that's the reality that we need to, to deal with. We also need to humble ourselves so that we can surrender to God because God can only administer healing to us when we actually allow him to come in. And that can only happen through complete wholehearted surrender. Um, you know, in First Peter 5, verse 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So trust he's got you and trust his daily process. You then, unexplained. Sometimes the toughest part of a healing journey is accepting that it's just happened for no reason. That if there is no logic behind it, that, that's just earth and that's just a fallen world. They're suffering and it, we might not be able to explain it all. Yes, in hindsight, you can maybe see that it's given you resilience and perseverance. Um, in Romans 5, verse 4, it says, Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. But sometimes you'll never fully see that, even in your time on earth, and you'll just waste your breath constantly wrestling him. You'll just waste your breath constantly exhausting yourself, going, why? Why me? Why now? Why this? 2 Corinthians 1, 4 says, he comforts us all in, in all our affliction. So may that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So just embrace his comfort, accept that it sucks, vent to him, relax in him, lean on him and just know that he is with you in it. And that he will still in due time use it for good because we can only comfort once we've been comforted. I think that's incredible. Then our reconciliation. This is the forgiveness part that you've probably all been waiting for from the start. <laughs> and it's probably one of the best steps that I've found the hardest. My first step in actually forgiving people was recognizing the fact that they're God's children. And you know the term children, we kind of expect toddlers to mess up all the time. You know, I've got cousins and I'd be really surprised if they were in their best behavior every time I babysat them. It'd be actually a miracle if that happened. And we as humans are absolutely no different. And I think it's completely apt at the fact that we're called God's children. No Christian is perfect. That's Christ's job. So we need to give each other the grace that we would give a child. Then the next step that I find in reconciliation and um, forgiveness was advice that was given to me by a very wise woman. And she said that you, you only know you've forgiven someone when you can say their name or hear their name and you don't go, mm, or you don't have a bad taste in your mouth afterwards. And I always kind of kept that in mind. So I kind of started then in lockdown anyone that I realized I was still carrying that baggage for my self-reflection, I started going, okay, in Jesus' name, I da -da -da -da, forgive them. And I did this every day until I felt like I could say it and it was actually comfortable. You know, in, in Matthew, I think it is 18, Jesus says, you know, he's questioned how many times should we forgive someone and the person, his response is 70 times seven. So regardless of how many times you have to do it, just constantly go, I forgive them. Constantly declare it. There's power in your words. And reconciliation doesn't mean that you will be besties afterwards. And that's okay. It's learning that reconciliation is, is just letting go of the hurt and not carrying it anymore. With that in mind, the final letter, T, 
time. Give yourself time. In Psalm 147, verse 3, it says, He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. That's a promise. There's no timeline on that promise, though. It doesn't say, and three months after the hurt, he will heal the brokenhearted and bandage their wounds. It doesn't say 30 years after. It doesn't give a timeline. So remember that your timeline is unique. And remember that you yourself can maybe prolong your timeline and you might not even notice how you're doing it. You know, pride can get in the way, stubbornness can get in the way, our own need for controlling things or our own enjoyment for self-pity can get in the way. Try not to allow it, but don't rush it. Stay in that quiet place that wee bit longer if you know that you're dealing with God. Stay in that place and allow yourself to lean in to God and lean in to what he's saying to you. And ignore what other people say maybe not the most popular thing, but if people say to you, oh sure, come on, you should be over it by now. Just know that you're dealing with it in God's time and you are walking through it. You know, have confidence in yourself and have confidence in God and the process. Ecclesiastes 3 is the huge chapter all about time and about how there's a season for everything. And even in that, in verse 2, it says about how there's a, there's a time to uproot. So trust that in the right time, that hurt will be uprooted from your life. I know that was the case for me. It was only very recently, I was at a prayer ministry event where someone prayed for all this hurt and anxiety to be uprooted from me. And I felt the release that I'd been looking for for about 10 years. Journeying through hurt is a lifelong process, but once you've healed from hurt, it's important to close the door. Not to forget your story because your life lessons will hopefully someday bless someone else and also will be the, the things that carry you through your next adversity. But it's important to close the door so you can guard your, hurt, your, your heart from any more hurt or bitterness seeping back in. Because the devil loves to do that, doesn't it? He loves to twist whatever you feel from and try and claim it back and make you go back. So close the door. Trust and surrender and journey through hurt with God and know that he will make all things beautiful in his time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for that truth that you make all things beautiful in your time. I thank you, Lord, that there is a season for everything. I thank you, Lord, that there's even a season for hurt and that that hurt shapes us to go on and do whatever you've called us to do and face whatever trials are ahead and to walk with other people and comfort them in their afflictions just as you, as you have comforted us, Lord. Lord, I pray for the people that are hearing this message. I pray that they would be comforted as they journey through their own hurts. Whatever may have caused it, whoever may have caused it, Lord, I pray that they will lean into your strength into your grace, into your healing, so that they can be a blessing to themselves and a blessing to others, Lord. Meet with them now. Start that journey or continue that journey or even finish that journey, Lord. I thank you that we are a constant works in progress, Lord. I thank you the fact that you never stop working in us and working through us, Lord. And I just pray you'll equip each of us to do that in the right time that we will all just trust your process and lean on you in good times and in bad. In Jesus' name, amen.